Hey everyone, welcome to week 43. This is day four. This is Thursday. This is our ongoing wash and chroma week. We have painted Manu, we have painted Sepa. Yesterday I painted Danny. You know, long lasting relationship, strong bond. Uh, we are stronger than a fork, so don't worry guys. And today I'm gonna paint Fed. And today is gonna be a really particular painting experience for me because I thought I was doing well and then I didn't like what I was doing and I had to draw on top and I think it ended up looking cool, but it's not what I expected, but I like it. So you guys will see. Okay, let's get started. Uh, this is Thursday. This is day four of our ongoing gouache and chroma week. We have figured out that at least we can deal with 50% of that equation. I think the chroma part is not giving me that much of a problem. I haven't been trying to cancel my saturation. I haven't been trying to overmix my colors in order to lower my saturation. And I'm very proud of that because I think my instinct, loving grays like I do, is usually to try and cancel my colors out and neutralize everything. Um, initially, I will see a palette like this and it would seem a little overwhelming, but I think immediately after looking at all these hues, I would try and spot the options that I have for neutralizing colors and I would feel comfortable then. But this is not quite what I'm doing throughout the paintings. Like obviously I am mixing complementaries to try and get some chromatic grays into that mix. Not all the colors in the painting have to be super high chroma. But I think that overall, I'm assuming this exercise well in that respect. I'm looking at all the options that I have and I'm trying to respect their saturation and I'm trying to use their saturation. I don't quite feel like a fish out of water. It's not like I'm doing something that feels incredibly foreign. No, it just feels outside my sensibility. Like this is something that I would feel corresponds to other painters, that I would feel like this is a place where other painters can have kinship. I'm not quite there. I don't know if I'll ever be. I think that sometimes in life, we recognize things very early on and we make decisions based on those observations. And I think for me in my history as a painter, one of those discoveries, if you will, was recognizing that I love grays. That is where I feel the most comfortable. But that doesn't mean that I can't paint a saturated picture. I just have to step out of my comfort zone a little bit and say, okay, let's play this role. Let's see if I can understand what I have to do competently. And it goes back to what I say almost every single week. In order for me to be able to paint these paintings, I have to be conscious that uh, my fundamentals have to be strong. I really have to go back to basics. And in that sense, it's been a lot of fun. Now the gouache part of this, the water miscible paints part of this is the one that's gonna give me trouble. A lot of you have been super kind and have been giving me suggestions as to you know brushes that are maybe more appropriate or paper that is probably more appropriate. And that's totally fine. But honestly, as an aside, I don't really want to feel that, especially with a medium that is kind of foreign to me. I don't want to feel like there is a proper way of doing it and I'm not quite doing it properly. I kind of want to feel my way and discover that for myself. And the reason I want to do that is because it's probably the same reason you guys see me paint in sketchbook and papers and in just loose pages. Like I'll use any surface that I can get my hands on just to give it a shot and just to tell myself that I am not beholden to my materials. Like I can be a painter, I can be a strong painter, hopefully, even if my materials are against me, even if they are not the best variables that I can put together in order to make a solid painting or at least a painting that would validate whatever ability that I may have. I, I don't really see painting as a showcase. I don't see painting as an opportunity to show off. I really do feel this is hard enough. It doesn't merit that. It, it shouldn't be a place where we feel like we're above painting, like we actually conquered this beast that is painting. 
I just see it as a place of learning. I see it as an academic opportunity. I see it as a place of learning. I see it as a place of growth. So I don't think it's a place to uh, to show off, or in that case, to show off the properties, the beautiful natural properties that paint has. I think that in the same way that you could grab any piece of paper, like copy paper, and grab a number two pencil, and then proceed to do one of the most beautiful drawings that humanity has ever seen, I, I think painting is the same way. You know, it's very basic. It's very fundamental. So the fact that we have forged such an incredible bond between our materials throughout time is definitely a plus. That actually has aided us in understanding painting more. But it doesn't mean that that's the only way to paint, that if we don't use those materials, then we don't paint. If we don't use great paints, then we don't paint. If we don't use proper brushes, then we don't paint. No, I think you guys have heard me enough times say that I don't want to subject myself to any of that. I don't want to be beholden to any of that. I want to be given a brush, any brush, and I want to be given any paint, um, and I want to be given any surface. And I want to believe that I can be fluid enough to say, I'm going to make a kick-ass painting, you know, regardless of these things. And, and not even in spite of these things. I want to be able to understand their nature and say, okay, you know, this surface is asking me to do this and not to do this. And these paints are asking me to do this and not this. And these brushes are letting me do this and not this. And I want to be in that kind of uncomfortable but very open mindset where I just accept a lot of things and then try to make the best out of them. That to me is painting. You know, that to me is an integral part of being an artist and of painting. So I don't want to give that up. I don't want to convince myself that there is a better way I could do this. But I'm pretty sure I have good enough paper and good enough brushes and good enough paint to actually execute a really nice painting. So I think in that sense, I'm, I'm covered. With that being said, thank you all for your suggestions. I really do take them to heart and um, I will explore all those possibilities. If anything, you know, I'm super excited to just always try things out. So I'll definitely check, you know, all the options that you guys were kind enough to uh, suggest. Uh, the painting today, it kind of had two moments, I feel. Uh, one moment where I was feeling the confidence that I had felt from yesterday's painting, because I think with Danny's painting yesterday, everything kind of fell into place. I'm not going to say it's a perfect painting because it's not, but I think the painting had more of a organic development. I thought that would carry over to today's painting. And at the beginning, I was like, yeah, it's probably going to come together. And eventually, I started kind of modeling form a little bit and putting more paint down. And I realized that I wasn't very happy with my drawing. And that can be very, very frustrating because I started adjusting things. And I, I think we've all been there where we recognize that there is something off. And we know that we have to make a big decision. We know it. We consciously know it. Like we see it. We recognize it. We don't need anyone to tell us what we have to do. But it would require such a big change or it would require painting over a lot of things that we've already worked on that we can't muster enough courage to take those decisions. So what we do, you know, in a sort of concession is that we start fidgeting around and we start making these small, almost imperceptible changes, hoping that the addition of all those tiny little adjustments that we're doing is going to add up to fixing the image. And it never happens. You know, when we don't have the courage to make those big decisions, um, the painting will never ever go back on the right track or it will take an absurd amount of time and an absurd amount of effort. So instead of just making bold decisions that can change the painting immediately, we're exhausting ourselves just doing these tiny, tiny little changes, hoping that by avoiding making those big decisions that we know we have to make, we are in some way respecting you know all the work that we had previously done because many times when we have to change something we feel that we are disrespecting ourselves we feel stupid you know we've invested so much time and effort in doing something 
that how are we supposed to just feel nothing and cover it up as if all those hours of work meant nothing? So I, I totally understand why we can be reticent to not wanting to do it. It is natural for us to just hold back a little bit and say, no, no, I'm going to wait it out. <laughs> As if, you know, just by standing there on the sidelines, the painting is going to magically appear. You know, that happens to me when I know there's nothing at the fridge. But every couple of hours, I just go back to the fridge and open it up again. And I'm hoping that whatever it is that I want, because many times I don't even know what I want, I'm hoping that the fridge will know what I want and it will just materialize it for me. But I think many times that's the way in which we want our paintings to get fixed, you know, to be adjusted, uh, for it to just happen naturally if we keep on working. And we get so frustrated. I don't know if this happens to you guys, but we get so mad and so frustrated when, let's say, you know, we're taking a workshop or we're in class or, you know, we're painting along with friends. And one of our painter friends or one of our friends, it actually drives us mad when somebody who doesn't paint points this out, by the way, when they're kind of looking over our shoulder and they say hey you know that hand looks weird and we know it you know it's not like we can't see it we know it we just chose to do nothing about it and if they knew better they wouldn't be pointing it out because we know it <laughs> so I think that my painting was kind of stuck in this stage where I wasn't really happy with it and I could recognize that what I was missing was a lot of the attitude and the expression and the character that was inherent to this pose and I was missing it. I think I was concentrating a bit too much on the painting part of it. It certainly feels like you're concentrating on one aspect of the painting and you're trying to juggle all those other variables and keep them up in the air. And unfortunately, what happens many times is that when we devote so much of our attention to one aspect of painting, we run the risk of, you know, all these variables that are up in the air just falling to the floor. It's a very tough thing to do. Honestly, this is very, very hard. And it just requires a ton of attention and a ton of concentration just to just to realize at that moment that even though we are favoring something, we are probably neglecting something else. And we have to remind ourselves like every few other minutes that we have to check and see if, you know, all these other really important aspects of painting are taken care of. Again, that's a very, very tough thing to do. So don't ever feel bad if that happens to you. So what I did for this painting, honestly, was just say, ah, I'm gonna take my lining brush out and I'm just gonna explore my drawing. I'm gonna give myself the chance to kind of win back what I had lost and I'm gonna go for that drawing again. I'm gonna go for that attitude. And I told myself, well, if I'm gonna go for that drawing, let that drawing have attitude also. You know, let that drawing not be just these very abstract marks that are gonna guide me along the way, but let's imprint this painting with drawing that has character. And I was totally on board for that. I armed myself with the love and respect that I have for uh, Ruprecht von Kaufmann, best painter alive. I've said it before, and this is me acknowledging that Antonio Lopez is still alive. And me knowing that Antonio Lopez, Phil Hale, they're all still alive, I have to say, RVK, best painter alive. You could try and convince me otherwise, but come on, don't. So I thought of RVK, and unfortunately, thinking of Ruprecht does two amazing things to you. It fills you up with all the necessary energy because he is such a cool artist. I mean, he is coolness materialized. I hope that when I go to my refrigerator hoping to find something, I could find Ruprecht in there, like a little von Kaufmann sandwich. That's what I need. That would be perfect for me because he is cooler than anything that I can ever think of. He is cooler than He-Man. Whenever I think of him and whenever I, in my mind, go through a lot of his works, I get so charged up with energy that I'm like, hell yes, I can do this. Like, I can tackle this problem. But then comes the drop because... When you start thinking about him that much, you realize, I mean, this guy is so damn good that I'm never going to be that good. You know, he's doing so many of the things that I'm about to try and do that why do them? Why even pick up a brush? Why wake up? Why take a shower? That's right, Ruprecht. I don't want to shower because of you. So <laughs> what? So you get those unbelievable highs 
because you're really pumped and you are celebrating everything that he does because he is that cool. And then you get the lows because now you're falling from Olympus and crashed landing on Earth and you're realizing, oh, I'm not this good. So I thought about Ruprecht. I tried to channel a lot of the good vibes, a lot of the good energy, and I tried to embrace the drawing part of this uh, gouache painting. And I liked it. I mean, I realized that drawing on top of my painting is kind of like my go-to when I feel a little lost. It's almost like when the GPS has to recalibrate when you're lost. So I, I know that. I recognize that about my painting. Uh, the cool part is that I also was able to introduce a little bit of Malshevsky from yesterday, particularly his Chimera paintings. Oh my God, I remember seeing one in Warsaw, like the first one of those in Warsaw. And I didn't realize that he actually painted a ton of Chimeras in his work. I mean, he does a lot of like mythological figures, but I didn't realize that this was like a repeating motif. And when I saw this particular painting in Warsaw at the National Museum in Warsaw, I was like, oh, this is so cool. And then I discovered other paintings like this. And I'm like, oh, my God, this is cool and fluffy and adorable. I don't know. I loved it. I absolutely loved it. And the only reason I'm talking about this, because I think Fer's uh, left hand, our right, is actually so cool. It actually feels like a paw. And I felt that she was beastly looking in a sense. So I was like, maybe that's all the Malshevsky, you know, that I've had on the brain past couple of days. Plus, you know, Ruprecht also does like these anthropomorphic beings. So I was like, I don't know, this is coming out. Like I'm channeling some of this. And I didn't totally go for it. I mean, the only time I've gone for it is the one time that I painted dad as a Cerberus tiger, you know, a three-headed dad looking down at a doll while he was smoking a cigarette. <laughs> and that's the only time that I've painted something, you know, kind of thinking of those chimeras by a Malshevsky. But for today, it was nothing like that. It was just me recognizing that Fer, she does look a little feral. You know, she looks really cute, but if you uh, turn away, she'll kill you. <laughs> so I had fun with it today. I realized that the, uh, the traditional way of painting, you know, just putting color against color wasn't quite working for me. So I was like, okay, you know, let's give this a shot. I know that this is something that makes me feel better, I guess. I mean, I don't want to say I solely made it to make myself feel a little bit better, but I usually do it when I'm lost. And the uh, feeling of being lost, trust me, it's been permanent this week. So anything to just help me regain some confidence and help me understand that even though this is a foreign medium, I can actually use it in my own ways. And that's kind of what I did today. And I'm happy with the end result. I, I, I think it has a ton of character. And I was able to steer the painting, I think, in the right direction. So I'm, I'm happy about that. So that was it for today. Again, invoking these painters as if they are JoJo's stands. I'm, I'm hoping somebody gets that reference. It's kind of cool, you know, because they do provide me with a lot of energy, a lot of power. They psych me up. Um, but again, you know, we have to be careful that we don't get frustrated with ourselves when we realize that we're not as good as those amazing people. The important thing is always to just, you know, do what we can do and understand that the value of our journey lies in the fact that it is our journey and we are the ones who are supposed to be traveling through it. So it doesn't matter if there's all these amazing painters out there that are a hundred times the painters that will ever be. It doesn't matter. What's cool about life is just that we're supposed to walk down this path by ourselves and figure things out by ourselves and eventually come up with our own solutions. You know, however cool they may be. Maybe they're never going to be as cool as Malshevsky or as, you know, Ruprecht, but doesn't matter. They're our own and that makes them invaluable. So that was it for today. Uh, join us tomorrow for a last day. Last day. Thank God. I can't take more of this. Please kill me. I'll see you guys tomorrow. Thank you. Bye.